So, um, am I going to make that to everybody? So as you're coming in, if you would please let us know where you're from. And we'll let it roll. We're up to, we had 178 sign up for the webinar and we've got 46. You know, some people like last night I was supposed to jump in on a webinar and I totally forgot and fell asleep. <laughs> Felt really <laughs> bad. <laughs> uh, somebody's raised their hand. Let's see what there it's all about. Do. Mm -mm. Let's see. Uh, I'm just going to lower your hand, Carlene. If you just put it in the chats where you're from, that'd be awesome. Oh, see, we've got somebody from Australia. See, by doing it at eight o'clock at night, we get the Australians, we lose the Europeans. So that's why I'm always kind of moving these things around. Just see if I can um, kind of let people be there. Somebody's from Colorado, uh, Elizabeth Vandor. Um, see <laughs> somebody's leaving me a nice comment greetings from north north idaho so out your way yeah south carolina all righty so we'll give it another minute because there's looks like people are still joining uh, north carolina aiken south carolina bob and pat from massachusetts Nevada. So this is really cool. You know, that's the one thing about, um, there's two things about this um, stay at home right now. A, yeah. I can find people. And B, Alberta, I can, the other side of the border. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, Alberta. And you can chat with people all over the place. Uh, New Hampshire. Awesome. All right. So we're going get, to get going. Hi everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch. Uh, I've been hosting webinars uh, five days a week. Um, this week, I want to tell you about something really special that I'm going to do on Saturday. Uh, I'm going to have Nigel Casserly, who was the voice of the three-day Rolex event in Lexington, Kentucky, for 36 years. And so Nigel's going to join me because this year they've had to cancel the three-day event. And a lot of people are uh, really sad about that because it's a major event. It's, it's a social event as well as a major competition. So um, if you're missing out, join me. I, Nigel just gave me a video and I have an hour's worth of uh, the Rolex from 1982 and it's fabulous. I just watched it. We're converting it onto DVD from VHS and we got to get it onto the computer. So it's going to be really, really a fun, fun afternoon, three o'clock on Saturday. Um, you do not have to register because I forgot to put that on. Um, it is limited. So do please be sure you jump in early. Tonight's guest is Dr. Stephen Peters. Uh, Stephen is a friend of mine that we've known for about seven years, I think. Yeah. Um, Stephen is a human neuropsychologist and he's co-written a book with Martin Black called Evidence-Based Horsemanship. What I so appreciate about Stephen is that he has not only looked at the horse's brain, but he's broken it down into understandable parts to help us understand how to train our horses. And so, um, a couple of weeks ago, we did what you called Brain 101. Um, and we just went through a series of slides and talked about what, how the horse's brain functions. We're, um, Stephen, I'm going to ask you to just do a really brief overview of that lecture before you jump into tonight, just in case somebody wasn't there. But the best thing that everybody can do is to go back and watch Brain 101. It's on my YouTube channel, Surefoot Equine, um, so that you, you know, can uh, listen to that information and go through that whole um, slideshow that Stephen presented. It was really fabulous. And um, people loved it so much, Stephen, that's why you're back. <laughs> well, great. Uh, yeah, the last time we met, um, it was more conversational. And what we thought this time uh, would be, a, we'd be a little more structured and give you a little better chance to sort of follow along. To catch everyone up, um, Basically, some of the things we're going to talk about are the, uh, the horse's autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system uh, is broken down to the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. What you know as uh, sympathetic, fight or flight, or parasympathetic, rest and digest. And why it's important in terms of training and getting along with your horse and I think more of us really want to have a relationship with our horse versus just force our horse to do something. Because I think that pays off for us in the long run. Um, 
so I want to emphasize that the horse is a really a motor sensory creature. And uh, oftentimes when we think they think like humans, we can get ourselves in, in a lot of trouble. They do not have that uh, complex frontal lobe uh, neocortex. So they're not thinking up and planning uh, to get one over on us. You know, horses are not disrespectful. That's an abstract concept. So by calling them disrespectful, and you hear that in the horse world all the time, they're really not capable of that. If they're walking into your space, either you're sending some sort of message telling your horse that it's all right to do that, or you've inadvertently trained your horse to step into your space, but your horse is reacting to you. So something in your message isn't, isn't really clear. So tonight, some of the things I want to talk about are uh, uh, trying to optimize learning, uh, basically a 101 rehash on, on how horses' brains do work, and then some things that you can maybe take home in your, your toolbox. And what I tell everyone is just, you really never have to believe a word I say. And you shouldn't. You should be skeptical. So I try to stay as evidence-based as possible. So I always tell people, look these up. And better yet, ask your horse. If it doesn't work with your horse, then it doesn't make any sense anyway. So go ask your horse after we've gone over some of these things and see what they have to say about it. So, Wendy, if that's a good enough start, I'm just going to go right into the slides and start to talk. Yeah, let's do it. All right. So, Wendy had mentioned, can everyone see the slides? Is that um, Wendy? Not yet. So, you just have to do your screen share. Okay, and, hold on. Yep. Screen share. Now, where was that again? So at the bottom of the Zoom window, there's a little green ah, up arrow. Bottom. Yep. And you click on that, and then you pick which desktop you want. There you go. You got it. Okay. Well, this is uh, a uh, picture here of Martin and I. Martin Black is a fifth-generation cowboy, and you really can't say anything in science without a lot of numbers. For example, you know, you'll often see studies of uh, it'll say an N of six. That means there were six subjects. So if you have six horses, they're all in the same, they're all kept in a stable, in stalls. They're all fed uh, sugary grains. Well, we can't generalize uh, research on those six horses out to the whole horse population altogether. So what I needed was empirical evidence and in big numbers. Well, Martin, being a, a fifth generation cowboy, his family has supplied horses to, to the government for in every war we've been in up until World War II. And then he's worked with Mustangs, race horses, uh, dressage horses, draft horses. So he, he, across a, a wide, broad spectrum of horses, He'd tell me about horse behavior, and I would be able to talk about the underlying neurology. So as you can see from this picture here, we dissected out a lot of brains and looked at the circuitry in those horses. And we, Stephen, if you hit your slideshow, it'll make that picture big for us. If you start your slideshow. So just go up to your menu bar there where it says slideshow. Oh, just do it like I'm just giving my regular slideshow. Yeah. Yep, and um, it should work. Play from the current slide. Yep, uh -huh. Okay. Actually, this is kind of a pretty good cut, and I don't have necessarily, well, I do have a pointer. Can you see my? Yes. Curtain? Okay, these big areas here, and I should first explain, if you want to know how important something is in the brain, it's either going to be its strategic location or its size. And if you look at these two big bulbs here, this is the underside of the horse's brain. These are the olfactory bulbs. This is smell. The horse has a tremendous uh, sense of smell. Oftentimes, 
you think that horse is smelling its saddle blanket when you're about to put it on, your horse has sm could smell that well far away from, from that. They're, they're pretty much just exploring with their vibrisi uh, sensory feelers, which you call whiskers, which I guess now in France and Germany, it's illegal to trim those, I think. Yep. Yeah. More countries are going that way. If you look at this here, these are the optic nerves that go to the eye and they cross right here. So a lot of people don't necessarily know this. Although the horse has its eyes on each side of its head, its right eye can send that visual information to the left side of the brain. It crosses right here in an area called the optic chiasm. So those are just some minor things to... So can I ask a question about that? Yeah. Okay, so um, we also have that optic chiasm, right? So that we, our eyes cross to the opposite hemisphere? Yes, we do. And then one of the things that I read was that the, the left side of both eyes goes to one side and the right side of both eyes goes to the other. Have you ever heard about that? In well, other words, they, step, they divide the human eye into left and right. Yes, that's correct. So the, the internal field and the outside field on each side gets crossed. So some things just stay on the same side and go back to the, the optic, I mean, back to the occipital lobe. Revision, and some crosses over. It doesn't completely all cross over. It's split up. Is that same in horses? Yes. So... Yep. One of the old myths is that, you know, you have to work the horse on either side because you have to, quote unquote, train the other eye. But oh, if, what a good question. <laughs> yeah. If the horse has all these cross connections between the two eyes to the different hemispheres, then that blows a big hole in that myth. No, it does, it does not. It doesn't. Not necessarily. Okay. The, uh, there's a structure in the middle of the horse's brain called the thalamus. And that's like Grand Central Station. Everything goes to the thalamus, and then the thalamus sends it out where it needs to go. There are connections from the eye to the thalamus. So a horse being a motor sensory creature, when it senses a threat, right, that signal is sent much faster. Even a small amount of information is sent much faster to get the horse in position to bolt and get out of danger before any thinking can even take place. Almost like I snuck up behind you after you've seen a scary movie mm -hmm. and you're sort of on edge and I say, boo, okay. <laughs> but startle, exactly. And if I did it on the left side or the right side, it wouldn't matter, you'd still jump. Right. So what we have to do is what's called down regulate. We have to send those messages down different pathways so that they're not going right to the thalamus, to the amygdala, in creating fear. They're going to the thalamus and then on to the motor strip where they need to go to just stay calm. So we've got to override uh, the system chemically, actually. So you have to do that on pathways on both sides. You'll notice. When you move to the other side, like the left side, after you've already taught something on the right, mm -hmm. that the horse won't quite be as jumpy because some of that information has already gotten through. Okay. So, Good um, so they have the cross hemispheres, but it's also going to the thalamus, which means that we do, it's just like us, we do have to work on both sides to work on, if you will, our ambidextrous, you know, to get us more ambidextrous. Mm -hmm. um, but this idea that they don't transfer information, that's kind of the myth that I was talking about is some people say yes. they don't transfer information. That's not true. No, in fact, let me hustle through here and find if I can find a good brain slice. Yeah. All right. This big band right here. Can you see that? Yep. Okay. That's the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum's job 
it is simply to allow information from one hemisphere to transfer over to another hemisphere. Now horses are like we are. The left side of their brain works the right side of their body. And the right side of their brain works the left side of their body. Well, think about it. How could they trot in diagonals if that information wasn't shared back and forth across the, that avenue? Let me see if I can find you something really interesting here. It's oh, we'll just keep moving ahead. <laughs> in the middle is a horse brain. And can you appreciate, I, I'm hoping you can see that little bit of gray area up there on the, on yep. the, you know, what would for us be largely frontal lobe? That would be neocortex. In the horse, that's motor cortex. So that's even more evidence that they're a motor sensory creature. And if we're trying to interact with them and we can understand where they need to be neurochemically so that they feel safe uh, and they can, they can start to self-regulate and feel calm in a lot of situations without a lot of thinking. Oftentimes it's our thinking that, oh, they're trying to get one over on us, you need to stand still without trying to understand why does that horse want to move versus trying to force that horse to, to stay in one spot. Once we know why, then we can set up the type of environment to allow the horse to seek relief. That's really what they want is just to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Behaviorism, and this isn't a knock on behaviorism because animal behaviorists have done tremendous things and still do. But back in the 60s when B.F. Skinner started all his animal research, basically what they said, and there's still studies set up this way, that we're going to just measure the input. What's the stimulus? Uh, what are we doing to the horse um, to get them to do something? Then we saw the brain basically as a black box. And what we would measure would be the output. And we'd say, okay, that's all you can do is you just measure your stimulus and then measure your output. But, and they said the, the brain was a black box and anything we had to say about the brain was really just conjecture. Well, we can look at that brain now. We have the technology. This is a horse getting an MRI. And this is a horse getting a CT scan. And in fact, <clears throat> I have some new neuroimaging. I probably should have loaded it. Oh, wow. But uh, a German group has used um, a very powerful magnet, uh, three Tesla magnet. And they can take pictures of the horse's brain. And so they'll take a whole series and then put them together and they've been able to create 3D images of the horse's brain. And actually what they're trying to eventually do, which seems pretty incredible, is to, to do functional MRI with horses at some time off in the future. Right. Let me explain what functional really MRI is. looking forward to that. <laughs> this is gonna be great, because then we'll know what Surefoot's all about. That's exactly right. Yeah. I'm really excited about that. The way functional MRI works is that <clears throat> it's taking a picture of the brain in real time. Blood will rush to areas of the brain that you're using. So if you're reading a book, I could look at a, at a screen and I could see uh, which areas of your brain you're using to read that, that book. So if we were able to do this with horses, we'd be able to tell for sure which areas of their brain they're using in training. And we could for certain horses, customize their training, which would be fantastic, without creating a lot of discord in their nervous system and getting them up in the sympathetic nervous system, you know, where they're uh, too flighty to, to even think. You know, if, I think one of the things that we're all starting to learn <clears throat> is horses are asking, am I safe? Am I safe? And you're not going to get in too far with them at all unless you can answer that question. And they'll ask it again and again. And we've got to reassure them that indeed they're, 
they're safe. And we'll talk about something called polyvagal theory, which has really caught on. And that really is um, scientific evidence to support the idea that, yeah, we all have to feel safe. The kid in an inner city school who thinks he's going to be beaten up by gang members can't focus and pay attention to his class. You know, he's too high up in the sympathetic nervous system. So um, <clears throat> we'll get to that. Ah, here actually are some of those pi pictures. These are your viewers tonight are seeing some of these pictures for the first time. The, these are uh, three Tesla magnet images of a horse's brain. These are brain slices. Up at the top here, there's the optic chiasm. That's the cross in the optic nerves, sending information to the other side of the brain. Here's the large corpus callosum that allows information to travel from one hemisphere to the other. And here's how they put them all together and been able to create 3D models of horses' brains. So we're getting really pretty sophisticated. Wow. Here's a, here is, um, this is an EEG monitor. What we're looking at here is electrical signals in the horse's brain. So you can see we can, we can take these electrodes and uh, these aren't stuck in with needles or anything. They just are uh, a glued on patch. And we can place these patches wherever we like. So here's, uh, let me get my little arrow back. Yeah, yep. left frontal, left occipital, right frontal, right occipital. So we can place those little electrodes where we like, and then each one will read electrical activity in the horse's brain. Now, a lot of people, some myths are really crazy out there, such as, <clears throat> wow, is the horse's brain really just as big as a walnut? No. <laughs> and Wendy, now you've seen a couple of brains, some small yep. ones, some big ones, but there are, it's about the size of a large grapefruit. And can I move our image over? Let's see. Yeah, what I did yeah. was I uh, just diminished. There's the... Um, oh, good. Yep, yeah, you can just yep. diminish and then you get that corner. This area here, this big chunk, which almost looks like another brain altogether, is the cerebellum. Much larger relatively than ours. Cerebellum actually stands for little brain. Its job is sequencing, fine motor movement, timing, balance. So you can get grasp just how important that structure is. You know, especially if your horse is learning routines and needing to put its feet precisely, fine motor movements. And that's for all of us, uh, not just uh, dressage, you know, there are some cow ponies that really just need to make one step or half step, you know, not to stir things up. That's all using the cerebellum. Okay, now let's see here if I can get it. You got to click back on your screen to move it to the next slide. Aha. Uh -huh. Yep. All right. There are some structures we talked about, but in the interest of time, we're going to fly through those. Sympathetic nervous system is fight and flight, parasympathetic, rest and digest. So you've often seen uh, horses in both, and I'll just uh, go over some examples real quickly so you can see so what we're... Can I, can I say one thing though, Stephen? That, yeah. Um, if you go back to your, per, your slide just before that one, um, if, we're, if we get too much into parasympathetic, we don't get off the couch, right? I mean... Exactly. So exactly. We, we need some... Like to just stand up and move, we have to have some sympathetic. It's a question of the range of it, right? 
exactly right. And uh, I was going to try to fly through that as an overview and show that, but, but let's just stop with that question right there. <clears throat> because it depends on how we're reading our horse. There are some people that say, well, I don't want my horse in the sympathetic nervous system. And their horse has their head down below the withers, they're grazing, they got their leg cocked. That's the kid in school who's looking out the window or falling asleep on his desk. There's no way that you can learn without being aroused. So there's an area of the brain called the reticular activating system. It's taking in all the information. But if you're tuned out totally, then, then you're not going to be able to learn. And the same with, with horses. We need some anxiety. Or we need some uh, arousal is probably a better word. But with us too, you know, if uh, a little bit of anxiety in, in research has found it, shown that that's good for, for learning. But we're a little anxious, we're a little unsure, that makes us seek out information and focus our attention much better <clears throat> than if uh, we're in a, a lecture that just rattles on and on and will never be tested on it, or we just drift off. They've also taken <clears throat> and uh, blocked some fear circuitry. Chemically, they were able to block fear circuitry. And then they tried to teach learning and thought, this is going to be perfect because <clears throat> these animals now are not going to have any fear. And they'll be able to just really focus without fear at all. Uh, and lo and behold, what they found is the animals had no motivation to learn. So you need just enough arousal to stay focused. Such we, a fine line, isn't it? It really is. And understanding where your horse is, because there are people that will look at their horse and say, my horse is out of control, and actually they're alert. Yeah. Or, you know, um, yeah, my horse is paying attention and your horse is asleep. So these horses would be in the parasympathetic nervous system, right? So they're, they're grazing, the heads are down below the withers. This right here is actually perfect for being in the right neurochemical state for learning. The ears are up and focused in a direction, the eyes are focused in a direction. <clears throat> of course, if we created a little more arousal, then we'd be touching on fight or flight. And our horse wouldn't really be able to process what we were trying to uh, get them to learn. So this is moving up into the, so that you have a general idea, higher up in the sympathetic nervous system. You start to see the whites of the eyes. Look how tight those lips get. Yeah. And that's what happens is their mouth dries out and their lips just slam shut. There's a, a cranial nerve. If you're gonna know one of the cranial nerves, one of the big ones to know is number nine, the glossopharyngeal nerve. The reason you wanna know that, it's parasympathetic arousal of the salivary glands. So that's what's responsible for licking and chewing. And so when your horse starts goes up in the sympathetic nervous system and drops back down in the parasympathetic nervous system, one of those signs is, is that they're coming back into a more comfortable area is that licking and, and chewing. More arousal, you can see the head's way up above the withers, the nostrils start to flare, and we can actually get to a point where they panic. And they, they can lose uh, their sense of self-preservation. That's where we've got them so juiced up that they'll run through a fence or off a cliff. <clears throat> through a person. Through a person. And what we don't want to do is stay up there and stay after our horse when they're in this range because that, that potentially creates a trauma. All that, that energizing of the amygdala for fear and then anything that even remotely resembles what the horse experienced will set off. Uh, so that's where you say, 
I don't understand. My horse was fine for a year and then all of a sudden blew up out of nowhere. Sometimes there's a previous trauma and something in the environment can set that off again, especially with a horse that you don't really know. You kind of don't know their history. And here would be a horse that's now dropping back down in the parasympathetic nervous system and you start to see that, that licking and chewing. This is really a good time to, if you've taught your horse something and they've been a little bit aroused through the whole process, this is where we wanna use the most valuable tool that we have, the pause. Trainers want to keep doing, 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 and drilling. It doesn't allow the horse to assimilate the information. They can learn, but they learn bits and pieces of sensory and information. <clears throat> it's harder for them to put together. But this is like reflection for us. If we can reflect on things, then we can start to connect the dots and, and associate it to other learning. So <clears throat> really, after we've taught the horse something, that pause without any external stimuli, you know, we want to run up and slap our horse. Way to go. Good job. That would be the same as, you know, if I did this, that to you, spanked you on your, the back of your shoulder blades, after you've done something, it would be jolting. <clears throat> this is just a picture of the glossopharyngeal nerve, and it's going to the salivary glands here, uh, just to show you how, where that licking and chewing comes from. This is a model, a pyramid that, that Martin and I worked on. And showing you basically, let me bring that little cursor back, there we go, an area of optimal learning. So what we wanna do, it's almost like a toggle switch. We get the horse so that they're curious and we're starting to get dopamine. The horse is searching out information and they're curious. And when their curiosity is satisfied, they, get a, they actually get a dopamine hit. That's for us too, when we're trying to search out information. It's, a, it's an active process. But if they go too far, we, they start to become suspicious and move towards self-preservation. <clears throat> now the amygdala is kicking in. So the art is to understand that horse and keep toggling back to stay with curiosity as much as we can. The more we do that, the, ho the horse um, is less fearful and their ceiling starts to grow so that they're, they're less likely to go into the sympathetic nervous system and their ability to learn just increases. Can you so talk a little bit about the amygdala? Because I'm not sure uh, everybody's yeah. with us on the amygdala. Where, okay. where it is, what it is, what it does. Yeah. Love your slides. Okay. <laughs> Let me get my cursor there. Here's the amygdala right here. So the amygdala plays a big role in fear and aggression, but largely fear. It's, it's the uh, security alarm in the horse's brain. So what we want to do is we want to seek out curiosity. And we know that the curiosity, actually we think there's an area for curiosity called the substantia nigra, <clears throat> It's interesting, substantia nigra means uh, black substance. That black substance happens to be dopamine that you can see with the naked eye, the, the colors that area. So we wanna get dopamine to the nucleus accumbens. So the more curious we can get our horse, the more engaged, we wanna set it up so our horse is solving problems. We, want, we don't want to make the horse do things because that's just rote learning. If we wanna create dendrites and we wanna create a lot of brain activity, then we'll actually help your horse to flourish with more and more brain connections. We want to really promote 
that uh, curiosity and the nucleus accumbens. So it's this back and forth initially from fear to nucleus accumbens. <clears throat> And is the amygdala, um, is that part of the brainstem or is that? Uh, no. no, part of the limbic system. Limbic system, okay. It's interesting in that, uh, can you see my, can you see me? You can, yep. right? Yep. Okay. About even with my ears is a structure called the hippocampus. Okay. <clears throat> that's related to memory. In fact, that's the area that gets little plaques and tangles in it when people get Alzheimer's disease. Okay. It gets into the, the hippocampus. At the very tip of the hippocampus is an almond-shaped structure. That's the amygdala. So that makes sense. If we think, why would a brain be made that way with, with memory, with the amygdala on the tip? Well, think about it. Those memories that have the most emotional force are our strongest memories. If you're traumatized, <clears throat> then that leaves a super memory that you can't get rid of. That's what PTSD is all about. <clears throat> That's why people have flashbacks that are as real as can be. It's a memory they just can't even flush. So th that's where the amygdala is. It's related to fear. What we want to do is avoid that structure, if at all possible. That's why it's so important to keep the, the horse in the lower levels of sympathetic arousal, because if they get too high, then we start to create a whole series of problems that are just based on fear reactions in the horse. So we, we wouldn't have been able to answer that question for the horse early on, am I safe? That's a question we want to keep answering. Even when they're, even though we have to, we need some arousal to learn, there still needs to be the understanding that, that they're safe with us. And we might be asking a little more of them, but we're not going to ask, they have experience that we're not going to ask so much that they're going to be traumatized or feel panicked or have to escape. Right, right. And there's a, uh, a neurochemical that adds to that called norepinephrine. You probably know that as, as adrenaline, much the same kind of drug. So let me just give you an example of how the, we want to take the high road. The high road is, is sensory information goes to the thalamus. The thalamus sends it to the motor system and the horse likes that. It's predictable. Here comes my signal. I'm going to just look for my release and my relief. I get a dopamine hit and I do what I'm supposed to do and I know I've done what I'm supposed to do because I got my release from the, from the rider. <clears throat> Let's use an example where there is not really a release, where the horse asks several times, am I safe? And we don't answer that question. We're gonna go on a trail ride, but we're running late. And all of our friends are already there. So we're going to go out and we're going to catch our horse. But this isn't like we usually catch our horse. we got our halter over our arm and we're, we're marching out there. We had a little jog. So the horse right away senses that something's up. You know, his head comes up. It looks at us. It starts to feel like it's being chased. And let's say we get hold of our horse and it doesn't want to come. So we kind of pull it along. <clears throat> We get up to the trailer, the horse is asking, am I safe? This doesn't feel safe. So we tie it to the trailer. Instead of giving it a chance to just calm down and maybe chew a little grass next to the, the trailer, what well, we've got them tied up. If we just tie them up and we throw on the saddle and they're jigging all over the place, then we rush them onto the trailer, slam the door, we go somewhere new, Every one of these things is just pouring norepinephrine into the horse's system. We take them out. We see our friends who are already up the trail. So we really don't have time to lunge this horse or to give this horse a sense of orientation where it's at. We hop on them. We take off. Your horse sees a boulder and spooks. And you think, where did that come from? What the heck? 
it wasn't the boulder. And, and people will say, well, I don't know why you went by that boulder like three times in the past and never had that reaction. Your horse didn't go through there all jacked up, full of adrenaline. And so that signal went to the thalamus and the thalamus sent it to the alarm system, to the amygdala. And the amygdala said, okay, I'm gonna send now chemicals to the pituitary gland that's gonna send them to the adrenal glands in the kidneys, and the adrenal glands are gonna produce the granddaddy of stress hormones, cortisol. So we got a horse filled with cortisol who, who we can't understand why they're different than our same horse when they were filled with serotonin. Well, we mix that cocktail. We have to take responsibility. We mix that neurochemical cocktail. So this is what I mean by their, their neurochemical state is actually a variable that impacts training. that We have to take into account. It's not just can they do task B, can they do task C, it's can they do these things and maintain uh, self-regulation. If a horse can start to know that we'll give them time and we can answer that question, you're safe, over time, we can put on a tremendous amount of pressure and that horse will stick with us and be able to manage. So, so uh, this is just kind of like a little redirect question, but like when you think about the military and that they had to rely on their horses for their, their safety and their transport, mm. they, they really had to make sure that that horse had that trust so that when they did ask them to leap off a building or over a cliff or whatever, the horse would go there willingly. Right. And so M Martin Black refers to these horses as special forces horses. <clears throat> he said, I've got them to that point where, and this is the difference between having a horse that, that's been allowed to learn when we're answering that question, are you safe, and building that big ceiling for optimal learning versus horses that get desensitized. We think desensitization is something good, <clears throat> but typically what that stands for is, is flooding your horse. And I want to get my horse desensitized so that they're not paying attention to anything, right? They're desensitized. That's not going to disturb them. Well, they can be like that for a while. And they can get pretty tight without responding to things. And we think everything's okay. But look at those horses oftentimes. You know, they'll be really tense. You can see those tendons in their jaw, et cetera. And sometimes those are the horses that will suddenly wake up ah, where am I? What's going on? And explode. What we really want, optimally, is a horse that's aware of that dog over there. They're aware of other horses over here, but they don't have to react. They're self-regulated. So we want a horse that's aware of everything, not tuned out to everything. Because when you're tuned out and then something surprises you, you come apart. Yeah, my friend coined a term called... Um slushy so like when a horse is in freeze and then he's he's kind of thawing a little bit he's slushy and things kind of come out that you don't expect because they're not shut down but they're not in learning mode they're in that they have to go through just like a person with ptsd there's a process that you have to go through when you've been shut down or been flooded to get out of that state and then be able to figure out how to actually start to learn right exactly right <clears throat> Maybe it's a good place to just bring up polyvagal theory. Can you just talk about serotonin for a minute? Because you've had it on your screen here for a while. Yeah, I guess everybody's been peak. looking at serotonin, and you mentioned it a little, but I, let's delve into that a little more before you could head on to serotonin. Actually, is a neurochemical that's becoming more and more important in learning. So we want to know about this chemical. <clears throat> Let me see if I have. It's related to emotional balance. So, most all of the antidepressants, mood stabilizers, are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs, they're called. So Prozac is an SSRI. Why would we wanna know about serotonin? Well, if you look over here, it's related to mood, 
fear, anxiety, feelings of relaxation, mental focus, learning ability, clarity of thought. That's a pretty useful neurotransmitter if we can mix a cocktail of that with our horse. <clears throat> Here's what we've been able to find in, in animal studies. This was a study done in 2018. Now, I'll explain it and then I, I'll, uh, or I'll tell you about it and then I'll explain it in English. Okay. Okay. Let me just first read the title here first. The effect of serotonergic stimulation on learning rates for rewards apparent after long intertrial intervals. Okay. <clears throat> what they found is if they took an animal and they taught it something and taught it something else and then taught it something else and taught it something else, one thing after another, without a break, right? That if these animals were put under pressure, any stress, <clears throat> they always defaulted back to their original behavior. So if fight or flight was the original behavior when put under stress, they always resorted back. Then what they did is they taught something and had a long inner trial interval. They take a break for a while, and then they teach something and take a break. And what they found was that that break allowed the animal to assimilate that learning. So we can't just learn something, we have to process it and stay with it to assimilate it in. And that takes some reflection. <clears throat> but when these animals who had the break were then allowed, were put under pressure, they were able to use one of the new behaviors that they learned. So if we don't give our horse enough time between breaks, they'll try to put things together, but they'll often default back to the old behavior. So it's us, if we're sending them, up, sending them up in the sympathetic nervous system under pressure, it's us that's blocking their ability to access what they've learned. That is so, is that also true in people? Let's talk about that. <laughs> Here's this guy and he's in a functional MRI. So we're taking a picture of his brain in real time while he's doing a task. He's writing something. <clears throat> what we did though, is we left the functional MRI on during his break and continued to take pictures of his brain while he was at rest. So we could look at what areas of his brain are lighting up while he's at rest. Well, it didn't just go blank. What happened was those areas of his brain that he used to do the task lit up again, the same areas, although he wasn't doing anything. His brain was replaying what he had learned. If we waited even longer, then new areas of the brain lit up. So it appears that what will happen is we'll not only replay what we've done, but then we'll start to associate it with other things that we've learned. And it's during this association process that we grew more dendrites. We drew out, we grew more connections to previous learning so we could put it all together. <clears throat> Did they find um, in that instance that there was an optimum length of time to wait or is that individual? <clears throat> My neighbors decided to mow his lawn just now, so I'm sorry I was a little distracted. Okay. But, but here's what Martin says, because people say, well, how long do I wait? Is it five minutes? Is it, is it 10 minutes? Martin says, if you've waited and you think you've waited long enough, wait longer. Well, the reason I ask, one of the most frequent questions I get about Surefoot is, how long should my horse stand on the pads? Mm. And it's so incredibly variable. Like my first experiment, the very first horse, I timed it for 15 seconds and there was a huge change. Um, and I've had horses literally just brush their foot over the chet pad and change. And then other horses, uh, people have them stand on it for five minutes and some horses 15 minutes. 
but there's still a process that I see them go through. They'll come off the pads and they're still processing. You can see mm -hmm. by their facial expression and their eyes and everything that there's still activity in the brain. They're uh, looking very meditative, if you will. The eyes will be closed. They'll be very tranquil. But you know, this question of how long on the pads, and then of course this corollary is how long off the pads um, to, to have positive change. And, and just in my experience, it's so variable that you have to look at each horse almost as an individual yeah. and kind of what's going on with them. So the horse tells you, right, Wendy? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, people have different temperaments. You know, there's, <clears throat> there's nervous people and there's lethargic people and, and our temperaments are all over the place as well. So uh, it really just depends. But the important thing here was when the person, this didn't work as well if they got distracted, if there were other noises outside, um, or if we asked that person a question. So we really had to leave them alone. So it was almost like when we're daydreaming and there's no distraction, the phone's not ringing, that's when we actually do our best thinking and that's where we can form associations in our, in our brain with previous learning and we can come up with, with new ideas. And we think that it's in this state, after you've taught your horse something, the same way, just back away and all you can really do is interfere because Martin's under the impression and so are a, no, a, a number of other trainers I've talked to that now start to think, you know what? I think my horse is actually replaying what I taught them because I'll watch them sort of drop off and then all of a sudden they'll come out of it and yes. then go back in again. And as long as I leave them in that process, you know, Martin did a little experiment in which he, he, would, he used to take one horse and put that horse in the round pen and do some training with the horse um, and spend an hour, let's say, with the horse. And then he decided, you know what, I'm going to experiment with this. I'm putting four or five horses in the round pen. They're comfortable as a group because of the herd behave dynamic there. And I'm going to spend 10 minutes or 15 minutes with each horse. So I spend 15 minutes with this one, I move to the next one. 15 minutes, I move to the next one. What he found was that built in an automatic pause mm -hmm. and allowed those horses to stop and lick and chew. And he said those four or five horses learned at a much faster rate and more information than if he would have put that one horse through for an hour. So 15 minutes was much more efficient with those built-in breaks. So I think we, get, we do something and we think, ah, that was perfect. Let me do another side pass. Let me do another one. Let me do another one. It, we start to drill them and we don't give them a chance to replay uh, this without outside interference and it doesn't get locked in as well and so the serotonin you think the serotonin is one of the neurochemicals that in that replay that's that's where you're getting serotonin yeah. and that's building our dendrites and making our neural connections yeah yeah and it seems that you need to be safe so that you're you're emotionally balanced so that would be the role of serotonin and it's this reflection that prompts the brain to stimulate these new connections and it strengthens all the learning. So we, ne you know, because a lot of trainers are paid for how much time they spend, right? So they feel they the pressure, they have to be doing, 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 doing something with all that time. When actually, you know, People may question, what the heck are you doing? You sat on the fence and you watched this horse for half an hour. What you did is you didn't interfere with the learning that you put in. But it's our model that makes this, that sometimes a little difficult. So that's actually like with, again, going back to the surefoot pads, you know, I, I see the horses and they'll, the, one of the hardest things to do is to get the person not to pet or interfere with the horse while the horse is on the pads. Yes. It's really hard to do. And I've got, you know, like they'll want to pet him or go up and rub on him or mess with him. And I'm like, you know, sometimes I'll just put them on pads away from their horse to keep them occupied. 
but I feel like when the horses are on the pads, they need more space, not less space. And then they'll step off and it might be, you know, 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes, but they'll walk off. And again, I just watch them and I leave them and they go through another layer of processing. And, it, and they really, the safety factor I find is huge with the pads that it seems to trigger the safe so that they can process, but you'll literally see them kind of come up out and then go back down and come up out and go back down and kind of cycle um, through some kind of thought. What, what thought? I don't know, but through some kind of cycle of thought. Yeah, and they need space and time, definitely. We all need space and time for learning. For example, when you, uh, your dad took the training wheels off your bicycle, right, for the first time, and then you just couldn't keep your balance and you crashed in the driveway and you said, gosh, I will never learn how to ride this doggone bike. And if you just kept at it again and again and again, that particular day, you just got worse. You reached a point of diminishing returns. You got so frustrated. You said, sell this darn thing. You know, I'm never going to get the hang of it. So you left it there and you went in and you had dinner, watched TV, and you went to sleep. Well, the next day, after that inter-trial break, the next day you went out and you got your bike and decided, I'm going to give it one more try. And somehow, magically, overnight, you got the hang of it. Well, your brain continued to replay that and needed the space and time. And that makes sense because what we're creating is neural highways. So if you send an electrochemical signal down in a neuron in your brain once, well, you got a rocky little path. But Hebb's rule is neurons that fire together, wire together. And if you keep firing that on your own and to replay it and think it through actually fires that neuron and strengthens it so that you get eventually a highway with information passing through and you get much better with that space, but you need that space and time. That's why that's why you can't remember a darn thing when you've crammed for a test because right. you did it all in a short amount of time and you didn't replay that enough chemically to be able to, to get what's called long-term potentiation. That's what it's called when we allow space and time. Yeah, so I think you answered the question somebody was asking, like how long a break and it, there, there's a, there's, there could be short-term breaks, medium-term breaks, and then obviously like long-term breaks, like the next day, like when we sleep on it. And right. it depends, dep like it sounds to me like with that functional MRI that they were looking, there was a certain part of the brain that's lit up in a short-term break, but as you make it a longer-term break, you're starting to get it to radiate through more of the brain or other areas of the brain. Exactly, exactly. And so that's what you wanna have happen. You want to allow enough time, and that's not watch time. You have to kind of keep an eye on your horse and watch if they're licking and chewing and if they seem comfortable and kind of dozing off after a learning session. Give them a good 10, 15 minutes sometimes. Martin will pull out his cell phone. He said, that's when I'm going to make some telephone calls because I'm going to give that horse enough time. And he's learned through experimentation with thousands of horses that that, that gap, is, is vital to learning because it's, it's that second wave. You might have gotten dopamine when you got a relief for having accomplished something, but you want that follow-up serotonin wash, and you want all of those, those dendrites to keep growing, and you want those uh, neurons to keep firing because the more they can fire, the better they're wired. So, so somebody's just put an interesting comment, I think, you'll find this interesting is that there are so many people homeschooling. One woman said, this is so informative because it's helping me understand homeschooling my children too. Ah, that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that except for the frontal lobe, which has all this abstract thinking, the chemistry and, and where people are in their nervous system and how people learn, is very similar. 
And here's what's really empowering. You're actually powerful enough to create a horse whose brain is filled with dendrites. But if you get to punishing your horse, if you ask unclear questions, if you don't answer that question, am I safe? If you continually do this, you'll produce a lot of cortisol in your horse. And the negative impact is it prunes back the dendrites. So you, over time, you can actually get brain shrinkage from putting your horse under stress. So you want to be trying to set up the optimal learning situations. Because then you'll really grow. You know, if someone's asked, um, you know, how, how do you answer the question or set up the question that we are safe? And this is where, um, where Surefoot comes in because using the pads with strange horses that I've just met, that they, they so quickly, and you've seen it, they so quickly recognize that I provide some level of safety that they recognize that, you know, right. I'm just coming in with a foam pad, but to them, it's much more than that. And within minutes, they're checking me out and they're going, you're the person I want to be with. I feel safe with you. And I find that fascinating, how fast they can recognize that. Yeah. For example, my example of just going out to catch your horse where you're just marching out there to get them. And let's say you never go out there in the pasture anyway. So you finally show up, right? Their head comes up and then we start chasing after them. <clears throat> what they've done is when their head came up and they first looked at you, they asked, am I safe? It's a good time to just stop. Just stop in your tracks. Maybe take a step back and wait for him to go back down to grazing again. And then slow yourself down and walk at a different rate and go scratch on another horse if you can yeah. and eventually work your way over there and then you're not a threat and they you've answered that question you get them up to the <clears throat> the trailer and they're all over the place don't keep doing simply back off and wait for their head to come down wait for them to lick and chew maybe you let them graze around the edge of the trailer there for a minute or two that's rest and digest. They go back into the parasympathetic nervous system. There's the second time in a row that you've asked, that you've answered that question. I've experimented with, if I go somewhere new that a horse has never been, if I take that horse off and I get on that horse and we ride off, the horse is going to take 10, 15 minutes, as you know. They're just looking all over the place, every little noise they're attending to. You know, you got to wait until you get that big snort, you know, somewhere down the, yep. where they're finally starting to, to let loose. Well, what I've experimented with, and, and I've talked to Martin about this, is as soon as you get that horse in a new environment, sometimes I'll let him graze. I'm not talking, now don't go and say, Dr. Peter says, tell my, my horse is allowed to chew on anything out there on the trail ride. They know the difference. Watch your horse. They're not just grazing. Those ears are going every which way like radar. They'll lift their head up and look around. They're getting acclimated to their surroundings. Each time they do that, they start to downregulate. If you'll just take a, a little bit of time, you kind of answer the question for them, am I safe? They feel much safer, and you'll find your ride is much less um, juiced up by by just thinking about looking at your horse and allowing them, and your horse will start, if you, your horse feels rushed and hurried, that's like you. you, if you're rushed and hurried, come on, hurry up, let's go, let's go, let's go. You start to get to a point where it gets a little panicky, and we can't learn under that situation. We don't feel comfortable. So, um, so that upfront time, if we actually could allow the upfront time to make sure that we're in a more relaxed state and that they get to a more relaxed state, everything's gonna go better. Yes. And oftentimes, I think you really hit the nail on the head. Oftentimes, we're a little nervous. We're a little afraid. We may say we're not, but oftentimes we're unsure of something. And, and believe me, that horse will pick up on that. Yeah. You know, that, that old saying that, Nervous cowboys have nervous horses and calm cowboys have calm horses. Yeah, there's a reason why. Their horse is reading them pretty well. 
this is no more than, than a, a picture of the brain stem, but just looking at all the chemicals that are involved in here, there's dopamine and there's uh, norepinephrine and there's serotonin. So all these chemicals are already in your horse's brain. Really all you're doing is setting up a situation where you can, like, like Martin says with Tom Dorrance, he used to know how to make the ultimate cocktail. It always kept his horses feeling comfortable enough that he could communicate with them. So it's really learning uh, to, to read your horse and set up situations that allow your horse to, to stay comfortable. And we, this polyvagal theory. Yeah. Is, well, let me, I'll talk about this real quick. Yep. This is a cool slide. I know, I love this slide. <laughs> These are dendrites in the brain. So, let me see if I can bring my cursor back here, yeah. So, you may just, by rote learning, my horse is gonna learn A, it's gonna learn B, it's gonna learn C, and just put one thing after another, and you may end up with a brain that looks like this. It's growing dendrites, <clears throat> but setting up situations that allow your horse to solve a problem. Your first water crossing allowing your horse to put its head down. So it has binocular vision. It's really just looking for depth perception. Um, being able to splash in the water a little bit without spurring that horse across. Letting that horse figure things out will actually create more and more dendrites. And the same with humans. If we, even if we're wrong, if we learn the process of how to solve things, it creates a lot more brain activity and, and dendrites than if we're just forced to answer questions rotely. And so we want that lovely right-hand image with lots of neural connections, lots of dendrites. We want a dendritic forest. <laughs> <laughs> we absolutely do. Here's something that we can give our horse to help them stay within the optimal learning range. What's called an internal locus of control. That means the horse feels that if it does something, it will get, a, it will get relief. It will get comfort. It's in charge. If we keep after our horse and there feels like there's no escape, then the, the world is acting on our horse. So if we allow our horse to eventually figure out the trailer, and eventually walk on. That's an internal locus of control. If we pull out a winch and butt ropes and all kinds of stuff and force our horse onto that trailer and pull them on, that's an external locus of control. And the worst cases of this are really learned helplessness. So these are experiments that were done. And, and I'm, I'm glad we're, how are we on time, Wendy? Um, I don't want to tell you because we've gone over, but keep going. <laughs> All right, let's, let's end with this because this is another myth I want to put out of the way because it, it really disturbed me that people said, well, I like this learned helplessness thing because my horse will stand still and won't do anything. Here's how you develop learned helplessness. They did experiments in the 60s with animals. So they would take a dog and put it in a, in a, a device and there's an electric grid down here in the bottom of this cage. What they would do is they would light a light bulb over A and light it up and shortly thereafter send an electric shock along the grid. So as soon as that light bulb came on on A, the dog quickly learned I better jump to B and avoid the shock. The light bulb came on over B and it jumped back to A and avoided the shock. What the dog had was an internal locus of control. If I see danger, I can get away. If I do something, I can get relief and I won't get shocked. Well, what they then did is they electrified the entire grid. And so the dog would have the light bulb come on in A, it would jump to B, it got shocked in B, it jumped to A, got shocked in A, jumped back and forth really quickly, back and forth, back and forth. After a while, it realized there's nothing I can do this is an external locus of control. There's nothing I can do to escape this. So if we kept after our horse in this way without giving relief, 
you know, we just kept nagging and after the horse, after the horse, after the horse, the same thing would happen. These dogs would just hover in the corner. They'd stop responding. They urinate on themselves. They, they would develop what's called learned helplessness. They get this dead look in their eye and people would say, well, look how docile this dog is. Internally, it created tremendous problems. They were filled with cortisol, chronic stress, and they didn't thrive. You know, they were thin, they, they lost interest in eating. They really wouldn't do anything unless given permission. They wouldn't even ask, so there was no curiosity left in this animal. So learned helplessness is, is cruel. It's cruelty, it's not a learning uh, tool to use at all. So. Wendy, I, we always blow through this time so quickly. So, but we, we have to end on a positive note. So the opposite of learned helplessness is? Allowing your horse to have an internal locus of control. Set up a situation where your horse has some choices. Can you show Better us a prettier that? picture so we don't leave, look at this in our brain and play it over and over? What's that? <laughs> Can you give us another slide so that we don't replay this over oh, and over that's in our scary. brain? Something pretty, there we go, yep. <laughs> Here is this horse who has an internal locus of control. This lady's not spurring the horse across, the horse is able to take its time. This will pay off, because if the horse gets across here and can figure out that problem and is able to assimilate it into its learning, then what happens the next time there's a water crossing and next time, it can face situations it's never faced before, and actually, because of these connections, can figure out a way to get around these. And so this is how Martin says you develop these special forces horses. You'll know because you'll say, man, my horse is getting so smart. They've just, they're learning so quickly. It's because we, we've given them problems to solve. So I think the thing that I'd leave you with is the future may have us giving our horses neural exercises versus just learning a task. They'll learn how to operate their brains. And man, would that be something if, and we're learning to image this and actually see these changes. So this is evidence-based. And I thank you once again for inviting me to, to talk to your listeners. And I, I hope they all got something out of it. Oh, I'm sure they did. So, so the moral of the story is we need to check in with our own internal state to make sure that we're calm when we approach our horses. We need to pause when we see that they're worried to give them a chance to come back down and let, ask them something that they get to explore and be curious about and problem solve and then provide sufficient rest so that they can integrate. Boy, I couldn't have summarized better. Good job. So Stephen, it is always a pleasure to have you. Um, I hope you'll come back again. I know that um, you know, you're going to be retiring and you're moving and everything else, but maybe when you get set up in your new life, um, you'll come back because I just feel it's so important for people to hear what you have to say so that they really understand how to approach their horse and that there are other ways of training besides the flooding and the, the, um, the uh, you know, the, 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 I forgot the word for it because I don't do it. <laughs> Sensitization. Sensitizing, that's it. That, that what we want is good learners, whether it's a child, a dog, or a horse, what we want to create is dendritic brains that are smart, that can make connections, that are good learners, because those are the ones that are going to take care of us. And we can all learn best when we feel safe. Right, right. Well, thank you again, and everybody, um, this... Uh, after the lecture, I'll put it up on my YouTube channel, Surefoot Equine. You can replay it anytime you like. Please do turn in tomorrow because I have Dr. Sherry Johnson, who's gonna talk about how to use Surefoot pads in rehabilitation. She's been working with Dr. Melissa King at Colorado State University and doing a lot of work with Surefoot. And then on Saturday, I have Nigel Casserly, and we're gonna go 36 years of the Rolex three-day event. Um, little travel through time so it's going to be and those horses and that was i was just watching the video tonight peter stephen and um the horses are so engaged and they're so bright and they're they're up you know they have some sympathetic but they're on target and they're doing yeah. the job and they're really loving their job and i think that that's the key is 
that we have to help these horses understand their job so they really love their job. Well, thank Exclamation you. mark. Yeah, thank you so much and thank you everybody for tuning in. And um, until next time, enjoy your riding. Bye, be safe. Good night. <laughs>